everyone and welcome back to When Religion and Crime Collide. I am your host Lacey Bean and today I am bringing you a very tragic case of when a cult commits murder. <laughs> Now today's case is very heavy, so the list of trigger warnings is long, so please listen to the whole thing. We're covering cult, and we're gonna be covering spiritual abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, and even physical abuse, and a lot of the physical abuse has to do with, towards children. Now when we get to the main crime of today's case, there's going to be a lot of mentions of torture and SA and unaliving. So if any of those topics are too much for you, please skip this video and I will see you in another one. Also heads up, this is probably going to be a long video, so grab a snack, grab a drink and buckle up. Hey everyone, this is Post Editing Lacey jumping into this video. And so after I recorded this entire video, I actually was able to connect with Crystal Leonard. She is the sister of the victim of today's case that we are going to talk about later on. But after I was able to connect with Crystal, I was able to get some more details for the case and get a really big update of like where everybody is at after the tragedy of today's case. So I'm going to be jumping into this video from time to time and kind of correcting or giving some more details of the case. And so you might see a change of pre lazy to post lazy, jumping in from time to time to kind of give you those updates. This case is a very long one. There are so much details, but when it comes to a cult, you really need all of that background information to understand how it went from point A to point B and having a tragedy occur. So I didn't want to leave any of these crucial points out. I wanted to give you a really good picture, but because of that, this video is going to be very long. It is very long. I'm coming in here after this and right now in my editing, I'm over like about an hour and a half right now and adding all of this in, it's going to be about a two hour video. So with that, I have decided to make it a part one and a part two, just to make it a little bit more easier for you to consume. I got all of my information or the majority of my information for this case from a book called Without a Prayer. And it was written by a journalist named Susan Ashlin. Now she may have said this in the book and I might have missed it. I listened to all of my books on Audible, but I did find out from Crystal that some of the names in the book have been changed. And so some of the names I'm going to say with within the story are not their legal names, um, but that is for legal and privacy reasons. Now, as we are going through this case, I would like you to please remember that it's very easy as an outsider looking in to say things like, how could they? Why didn't they just leave? How did it get this bad? It's really easy to say that from an outsider's perspective, but it's really hard to see an outside perspective when you are entrenched in occult and brainwashing, especially when it's tied to religion and your salvation is at risk, and when it's something that happens slowly over time, and it's not this big break of reality that happens in an instant. So please keep that in mind as we are going through today's case. I would also like you guys to remember that family will most likely be watching this video. I'm pretty sure Crystal's going to watch it, and so they're going to be reading the comments. So please understand that and keep that in mind before you comment something that's very rude or judgmental. Please be kind in the comments, okay? Now the cult I am talking about is the Word of Life Church, and the pastor of this church is a woman named Tiffany Irwin. But to truly understand Tiffany Irwin, we have to go back to the man, the myth, the legend, the founder of Word of Life Church, Jerry Irwin, which is Tiffany's father. Now, Jerry grew up with non-religious parents, but his parents did send him to like a local Baptist church for Sunday school. I think this was just like a way for his parents to have some alone time and kind of get the kids out of the house. Jerry says that when he was about 11 years old was when he received Jesus into his heart. He said the salvation prayer. But Jerry's childhood was far from sunshine and rainbows. Now, Jerry's parents were emotionally and physically abusive towards him, and his father would constantly threaten him and call him names. So because of this, Jerry ended up rebelling as he got older, and this led to him running away at 16 years old. And through a series of events, he found himself landing in Florida. Now, in Florida in 1974, he ended up meeting a woman named Robin, and they ended up getting married. Now, after they got married, Jerry ended up joining the military. I think he joined the Air Force, and they ended up settling in Illinois. Now, their marriage was very tumultuous. Jerry says that it was really hard for him to meet the standards and expectations that Robin would put on him, but I'm going to guess that Jerry was not a peach to live with either, and you'll probably agree with that opinion as you learn more about Jerry as we go on. Now, they did end up having a couple children, but their marriage was constantly a struggle, so they decided to try to go to marriage counseling. It was not successful, and they ended up getting a divorce, and Robin left with the children. This was very devastating for Jerry, and it just made him spiral out of control. 
So much so that he decided that in 1979, he was going to take his own life. And on his way, it was May of 1979, he was on his way to end it all when he said he had a revelation from God and he decided to not go through with it. Now, I am assuming over the next about five years or so, this is when Jerry really throws himself into religion. Now, five years pass, and in 1984, Jerry ends up meeting a woman named Tracy. Now, Tracy is described by her family as somebody who is very sweet, gentle, kind, obedient, and just a beautiful human to be around. But they also said that she was pretty naive and didn't have much common sense. Well, just like many other Christian couples, they did not waste any time, and Jerry and Tracy were married within just two months of meeting each other. And on the day of their marriage, Jerry decided to start his own church. Now, after Tracy and Jerry ended up getting married, Jerry's controlling side definitely came out. He told Tracy that her younger sister was a bad influence on her. Why? Now wait for it. Because she watched TV. <gasps> I know, we all clutched our pearls consecutively at that moment. Uh, apparently, you know, TV is of the world. And so if the TV is a bad influence on the younger sister, then the younger sister is a bad influence on Tracy. So Tracy, being the very submissive wife that she is, she agreed with Jerry and they decided that in 1986, they were not going to attend this little sister's high school graduation. Not only that, but after Jerry and Tracy ended up having kids, her very first kid, Tracy decided that she was just gonna cut ties with her entire family. Uh, can we say red flag? Now together, Jerry and Tracy ended up having five children. Their oldest is Tiffany Irwin. We will get into her later. And they had two boys after her, and then they had two girls after that. Now the two girls, we're not gonna mention very much. One of them comes up near the end of the story, but the boys, Daniel and Joseph, will be brought up from time to time. Now get this, Tracy knew that Jerry had had kids with his previous wife, Robin. So for the first 10 years of their marriage, Tracy made it her mission to find those children. She ended up making contact with them through like an online reunion type forum. But when she went to Jerry and told him that she had found his kids, uh, he was pissed. Now it shocked me, but Tracy actually continued like communicating with these kids. And at the beginning, for months, it was just her kids writing letters back to their half siblings. It took months and a lot of coaxing from Tracy for Jerry to finally reach out to his children. Now his two kids that he had prior were a boy named Mark and a girl named Serena. And they decided after reconnecting with Jerry to not make any like long-term connections and they just kind of cut themselves off from Jerry. Now my, my assumption is that the reason Jerry didn't want to reconnect with them is because they would kind of out him on probably like the toxic way that they grew up with him. Um, that is my guess, you know, that isn't in my opinion. That is no source of fact in that. That's just my assumption. Now, even though Jerry was the founder of this church, he was not actually the pastor. There was another man named Pastor Rick that actually held that title. So over time, this church ended up growing out of a bunch of different buildings that they were in and ended up landing and settling in a building that was like an old retired school building that was three stories tall and had a detached gymnasium. This school building slash now church building was in Chadwick County, New York. Now, eventually the third story of this building ended up turning into the parsonage for the Irwin family. If you don't know what a parsonage is, it's basically the living quarters for the pastor of the church. Even though Jerry wasn't the pastor, since he was the founder and he was like the end all be all of this church, him and his family were the ones to get the quote unquote parsonage. Now in this living space for the Irwins, there was a room that had a basketball court in it. There was another room that had a trampoline in it and they had a very huge uh, jacuzzi tub. Remember all of this for later, okay? Just lock that away in the back of your mind for now. Now, when they moved into this three-story building, they named themselves the Word of Life Church, WLCC for short. So for the rest of this video, you'll probably hear me calling it WLCC. At its peak, they had about 60 to 70 members. And at one point, they even established themselves at a school so that the members of the congregation could send their kids to the church for school. But none of the teachers who taught at the school were certified. They were literally just the parents of these children 
and a lot of the teachers would actually teach multiple grades at one time. Now, in the early years of this church going on, Jerry was actually seen as very kind and soft-spoken and just a gentle type pastor or leader for his congregation. But over time, he got very demeaning and would even say things to his congregation of like, I know what you do at home. I see what's going on. And kind of like trying to call them out for their sin, making them feel as if Jerry had a direct connection with God and he knew all of their sin, even when it happened in a place that he wasn't there physically. And this kind of just solidified when one day Jerry made a prophecy. If you don't know what a prophecy is, it is when a pastor or leader will predict that something is going to happen in the future and it does or doesn't happen. Now, they don't think they're predicting. They, they think that God has literally given them a message and said, this is going to happen. They don't feel like this is a prediction. They feel like it is 100% fact. Now, Jerry had prophesied that this woman, Joanne Ames is her name, something bad was going to happen to her. And shortly after that, the poor woman was diagnosed with cancer. Now, it was a very like progressive cancer that she was diagnosed with, and she had multiple bleeding brain tumors. And so one day when she went in to have surgery, she ended up having a stroke on the operating table and slipped into a coma. Now, the doctors, this is all what the church is saying, right? So the doctors had given Joanne, or Joan, um, no chance to live. But Pastor Jerry and all the other people went to the church and started praying for her healing. And in the moments of them praying, Jerry says that he felt something change in that moment and that in that moment, Joanne was healed. Well, Joanne actually did survive. She came out of the coma and she survived the cancer. But with the church hearing that the doctors had given her no chance to live, but then they went and prayed and now this thing happened... This just solidified the fact that, yeah, Jerry has this direct connection to God that they don't. Now, one day, Jerry decides to write the Constitution and Bylaws for the church. Now, this included requiring all members to attend church both Sunday and Wednesday, that you needed to tithe 10% of your gross, not your net, your gross income, and that you had to submit yourself to Jerry Irwin's leadership. But wait! If you followed all of these rules of the Constitution and bylaws, you got the benefit of being led by Jerry, Jerry Irwin himself. I'm not even kidding. That was actually written in their Constitution and bylaws. Narcissistic much? Now, not only did Jerry's preaching become more and more demeaning, but he started to control everything. Who you could talk to, where you could go, who you could be friends with outside the church or within the church, what kind of jobs you could have. He even had a rule that there was, quote, no idle chatter. So if you were just wanting to talk to another member of the church, uh-uh, that's a sin. Hush it. No idle chatter. You need to be talking about the Lord, sermons, and all things Jesus. Anything other than that, idle chatter, a no-no. Now, there was a member named Helen, and she wanted to join the military. But Jerry told her that if she joined the military, that God would withdraw his protection of her and that her life would just fucking fall apart. He then convinced Helen to help facilitate the divorce between another member, Al, and his wife. So I'm not sure if like his wife was kind of coming up against Jerry, but Jerry wanted them divorced. So she helps, in some way, shape, or form, facilitate this divorce and then Jerry turns around and says, all right, now, Helen, you need to marry Al. God told me. To... Sorry, it's Jesus. Follow what he says. So at 20 years old, Helen ends up marrying Al. And this was all orchestrated by the hands of Jerry Irwin himself. Now, after one holy communication, as Jerry Irwin likes to say it, God had told him that it was his time now to hold the title of pastor. So in that moment, Pastor Rick was ousted and Jerry Irwin was now the pastor of WLCC. Oh, shit. Now, many did not like this change and they left. But Jerry just said that they were heretics and they were destined for eternal damnation because, you know, their church is the only church with the right answers. Red flag. Now, after Jerry became the official pastor, things took a dark turn because it wasn't already bad. Well, Jerry knew that the congregation preferred Pastor Rick over him. Pastor Rick was more gentle, kind-hearted, soft-spoken, you know, things that a pastor should be. 
And since Jerry knew that they preferred Pastor Rick, um, it kind of pissed him off. Well, this just meant that Jerry's sermons turned very vile and demeaning. He would degrade the congregation right and left in front of everybody. He would go on and on about how exhausting it was to be the pastor of this congregation because all of the people were just sinners and rebellious and they refused to do any better. Also, Jerry started to get paranoid and ended up locking the doors to the church and he would not let anybody in or out while service was going on. He even put up hedges and fences to keep you know, the church more private from prying eyes. Now it's not going to come as a shock, but Jerry was also paranoid of the government and easily believed every single governmental conspiracy theory that is out there. Now from the pulpit, Jerry would accuse some of the members of his congregation of sexual sin. He would even accuse members of the congregation of wanting to sleep with his wife and are his daughter. <laughs> what the and Tracy, Jerry's wife, even said that she was convinced that the men in the congregation wanted her body. Now, Jerry had a lot of rules when it came to anything sexual of any nature. He even said that children, even toddlers, couldn't hold hands because that was considered mo. So I'm going to be referring to as S.A. for the remaining of this video. But when I say S.A., just remember that I'm actually talking about, even though it's basically the same thing. I think it's the same thing. I don't know. But I'm trying to like code it because YouTube, you know. <laughs> well, anyway, moving on. So little kids couldn't hold hands because no, no, that's a sexual sin. Now, as the kids got older, they were taught like in many other Christian circles that sex before marriage is a sin. But they didn't stop there. They said that masturbation was also a sin because it was allowing the devil to take over your body. Okay. And they were even taught that if you were to have a dream about anything sexual at all, that that was also a sin because it was as if you did it in real life too. They even were of the opinion that if you were around a child that was in a diaper but didn't have a diaper on, that that was considered SA. Kids were constantly being accused of sexual misconduct from every corner. The thought was ingrained in them of sexual misconduct and it was something they feared. It was like one of the highest sins they felt like they could commit. And so a lot of these kids came out later saying that they had even had dreams where they had SA'd another kid and then they had the fear of like that they had actually done it because a dream was as if you did it in real life. Like can, can we say trauma? Now Jerry told parents that if they did not spank their children that they hated them. He even told them to call them names, like berate their children, call them stupid, things like that. And they even had a Bible verse that they used to justify the beatings that they would give their children. And it was Proverbs 2030. Blows and wounds scrub away evil and beatings purge the inmost being. Now at the school, if the kids were being disobedient, they would get yanked up by the arm and beaten with a wooden spoon on the arms, legs, back, butt, thighs, everything. Jerry himself would even sit in on the lessons and if he felt like a child was not paying attention or if they were being rebellious, he would make them stand for hours and sometimes even write sentences. And when I say for hours, I even mean up until sometimes 1 a.m all while not getting food, and he would even yell at the children and their parents for hours as well. 1 a.m. What the fuck is going on? I might have said something along these lines earlier, but basically Jerry is now doing the exact same thing that his father did to him that he hated. He hated being berated and called names by his dad. And that so much so he ended up running away at 16, but now he's doing this not only to his kids, but also the congregation of his church. Not only that, but he's using the Bible and God to justify the way he is treating these people. Jerry even forced all of his congregation members to work very long hours. Each member was required to work three hours after every single church service. So they had to do repairs on the building, they had to do all the cleaning, and not only that, they had to actually pay for all the cleaning and repair materials by themselves. That did not come from the church's budget, that came from your own personal pocketbook. Jerry was so controlling that he controlled what jobs not jobs within the church, not volunteer jobs, I mean paying jobs. He controlled what paying jobs the members could have. 
there was a member named Bruce. We will talk about more about him later. But Bruce had a like master's degree in some kind of plant horticultural something. But instead of being able to actually like use his degree in a job where that would actually make him more financially stable, Jerry forced him to be a landscaper. Now, a landscaper was hard work and Bruce and his family struggled financially, meaning sometimes they weren't able to tithe the 10% of their gross income to the church like what was required in the constitution and bylaws. So instead, Bruce and his wife, a woman named Debbie, they would give the Irwins their food stamps. Now, from an outsider looking in, it can feel as if Jerry really did want to keep these people poor, and I think it was a way for him to make sure that he maintained that kind of control, because if they had jobs that paid more, um, maybe that money would give them the financial freedom to step away or leave the church, and Jerry might have been scared of that. I don't know, just a guess. If a member of this church did anything that Jerry thought was wrong or sinful, or if he thought that they were being rebellious, they would have to have what's called church discipline. Now, from my understanding, church discipline could kind of be an array of things, but a common one was called, I think, church arrest. And that was where a member of the church uh, was forced to be silent. I mean, no talking to anybody. And on top of not being able to talk to anybody, you had to stay silent. I mean, nothing. They were also shunned. And sometimes this could last days, weeks, months, and for a few members, sometimes years. What in the cracker jackpot is this? Now everyone was terrified of church discipline, church arrest, whatever it is. They were terrified of it. So they wouldn't question Jerry or his teachings or his preachings or his demands or the constitution or the bylaws. No questioning him. And they would just do whatever Jerry said to do. They thought that pleasing Jerry, since Jerry had this direct connection connection with God, that pleasing Jerry was in turn pleasing God. So they just went along with it. Now, one time there was a visiting pastor to this church and she gave a sermon and she said through this entire sermon that the women in the congregation were just bawling. And she did at the end of the sermon, like many, many congregations do and churches, is she gave a like salvation message of like, come up here if you want to receive Christ. And everybody in the congregation went up and she was kind of confused on like how and why it was so emotional. Um, But it didn't make sense until after, you know, today's case, we'll get into it. But after all of this takes place, she ends up coming out and says that she realized after learning about everything that was happening at this church, she realized that the congregation had never heard a simple, what she called a gospel message of Jesus, not a message or a sermon that was filled with grace and hope and mercy and the love of Jesus like she had given. And so her sermon was so beautiful and touching that it literally moved these people to tears and they were just so fucking broken because of Jerry Irwin, his teachings, and then later on, his sadistic child, Tiffany. Now let's talk about Tiffany and her siblings. So all of these rules that Jerry had in place didn't really apply to the Irwin kids. They kind of had free reign over the church. They could come and go as they please. They weren't really called out for being rebellious and sinners. If they were, it was a fraction of the amount of times that the other children in the congregation were being called out and even the adult members of the congregation. Now Tiffany was the oldest out of the Irwin kids and she was the typical pastor's kid who thought she was above everybody else. Now it was very well known that Tiffany was her father's favorite. She was even at a young, young age, like preteen, put in charge of kids at the school who were her own age. And this woman was so sadistic and cruel, she would leave these kids with their hands raised in class for the longest time just to be a bitch. It was said that as she got older, she seemed to relish in being like kind of sadistic and cruel to other people. And she loved getting other people in trouble and correcting them. She would even correct the other adults in the congregation, including her own mother. If her mom, Tracy, didn't agree with the correction, she would take it to Jerry. They would both go to Jerry about it and all the time, every single time, Jerry sided with Tiffany and not his wife. Now, today's case involves a lot of people. 
Okay, so in order for you to kind of understand what's going on, we have to give a background of a handful of different people. So now we're going to jump into learning about a woman named Linda. Now, Linda was the head of the school, and she is what we would call a teacher's pet. She had her head shoved so far up the Irwin's ass, it was ridiculous. She would try to like emulate the way that Jerry would preach, and she would do this in the school, and so that meant that to the children, she was just as sadistic and just as cruel as Jerry was in his sermons to his congregation. This meant berating them, this meant beating them with the wooden spoon, and so on. And not only this, she didn't stop at just the kids in the school. She was this way to her own children. One day, she thought that one of her children had sinned and had not confessed it yet or had come clean. And so she decided that on a ride one day in the car that she was just going to attack her child verbally to try to get them to confess. She was vile in this attack towards her child. She was cruel, berating this child, calling them names. I mean, it was one of the worst things I had read. And how do I know about this? Because she was so proud of being able to get her child to confess this sin that she recorded the entire thing on her phone so she could show it to leadership and brag about how she got her child to confess. And you won't be shocked to learn that the sin that she had got her child to confess and like had confronted her about was sexual in nature. We are not shocked. Now, besides the Irwins, the other main family in today's case is the Leonard family. So we are going to learn about them now. So the Leonard family was a blended family. Bruce and Deborah, more commonly known as Debbie, I will call her Debbie throughout the rest of this video, they got married. They were both married prior. And so when they got married, they came together and they actually both had had already a few children. Bruce had a daughter from his previous marriage named Crystal. And uh, Debbie had a two daughters from her previous marriage named Sarah and Whitney. Me. Then together, they ended up having Lucas, uh, Christopher, and two others, Grace and Ezekiel. I don't really talk about a whole bunch of their kids. Um, there's a few that I don't even mention throughout the rest of this case, but a handful of them will be brought up pretty consecutively. Now, the family were devout members of WLCC and had been for years. They tried to follow all the guidelines that the you know church had set forth, all the constitution and bylaws, but many times they fell short. Bruce was a very softy at heart, and so he was constantly being reprimanded for not disciplining his children like the church expected him to. Debbie struggled with being a good homeschool mom and keeping up with the housework. It was all very overwhelming to her, and Debbie really, really, really wanted to make friends, and so she would talk to people outside the church and even within the church, and since that was considered idle chatter or that she was trying to communicate with other people, outside the church, she was constantly put under church discipline. The poor woman was under church discipline more than she wasn't. She was reprimanded for so much, like allowing her kids to go to the neighbor's house next door, not spending enough time with her kids, denying sex to her husband because she wasn't in the mood, not being a good enough homeschool mom, not keeping up with the housework. I mean, constantly this woman was just reprimanded right and left from so many people, especially especially the Irwins. But Bruce was also berated by Jerry constantly. He was told that, you know, you're not being the man of the house. You're not taking your role seriously. And this is why Debbie is the way she is. This is why Debbie's constantly getting reprimanded is because you're not taking your role so much. He would berate Bruce so much to the point where one time Bruce broke down crying and begging Jerry to help Bruce learn how to train his wife. Rebecca Porter was a former member of WLCC. She had been a member, I think it was like 24 or 26 years, and she left in 2014. And she had this to say about Debbie. Debbie was the scapegoat at WLCC. She was a very gregacious and social person and did not toe the line when it came to leaders' demands. She was always under some kind of discipline. 
which meant that nobody could talk to her or interact with her. Jerry went so far with Debbie as to say that the reason that Debbie's father got sick and died was because Debbie had told a lie and that lie allowed her father to get sick, which eventually killed him. He even blamed the whole Leonard family and the stress of trying to disciple and lead the Leonard family. The, that stress of that was what made his wife sick. Now, throughout my research, I could not find anywhere where any of these members of this family or within the congregation got any kind of mental health diagnoses, but I am assuming that this kind of environment to be in constantly as Bruce and Debbie and as the parents of their children, I cannot imagine them not suffering some from some kind of mental illness during this time, even if it's just, which it's still you know, hard, um, depression, anxiety, you know, CPTSD, whatever. I, I, There has to be, in my opinion, there's got to be some shit going on. Now, growing up, the Leonard kids had a neighbor named Brenda. Brenda knew that the family had, you know, gone to and attended WLCC and that, you know, their home life was just not the best. And thankfully, Bruce and Debbie did let the kids go over to Brenda's house and since they struggled financially, they didn't have a lot of snacks and things like that in their house. And so Brenda would always make sure that she had snacks and sodas and things like that at the house so that when the kids came over, they could kind of raid her pantry and they got to have all that fun stuff at Brenda's house. Brenda would even give the kids the most random jobs to get, make it a way that she could give them some money, like a dollar, a few dollars here and there. And the jobs would be random, like I need you to wipe down the chairs, the, the legs to my dining room chairs. She was just somebody that really felt for these kids and knew that their home life was not the best. And so she was trying to just be kind of, I guess, a shining light for these kids. And I think honestly, she really was. Now, as the boys, Christopher and Lucas, got older, they begged their parents to be a part of the public school system because they just wanted to be like normal kids. They wanted to have girlfriends. They wanted to get their license. They wanted to go out and have jobs. They just wanted to be a normal kid. But Debbie and Bruce refused. They were like, no, that is part of the world. We cannot let you be around those kids. We do not want you. One of their biggest reasons was we don't want you around other kids who cuss. Little did they know, which I swear every kid at this age, uh, Christopher and Lucas were cussing when their parents were not around. Now, Lucas was an inventor and a repairman at heart. He loved tinkering. Well, one day he had been working on like a broken blue mini bike type thing and he had gotten it fixed. And so he was going up to the street. He took it up to the street to like kickstart it and take it for a ride. Well, when he kickstarted it, he actually like, I think hit the throttle and somehow went out into traffic and ended up T-boning another car. And how he T-boned it, it ended up crushing his knee and he broke his knee and he was in a lot of pain. Now, over the next handful of years, this knee bothers him from time to time. Remember this point of the story for later. Now let's learn about a few of the Irwin children. So Crystal, which was Bruce's daughter that he had brought to the marriage between Bruce and Debbie. This was the half sibling stepdaughter. Okay, Crystal was one that the Irwins loved and they would actually have Crystal over to stay the night time and time and time again. They kind of tried to like bring her under her wing. Well, Tiffany growing up loved Crystal and she did everything she could to gain the affection from Crystal that she wanted but Crystal was young and she didn't realize what Tiffany was wanting or needing. And so she didn't return this affection in a way that pleased Tiffany. And so Tiffany started to grow bitter and angry towards Crystal. And we find out later through Tiffany's diaries that Tiffany was very well aware that this emotion and this affection towards Crystal was actually romantic in nature. But because Crystal wasn't returning this affection like Tiffany wanted and that bitter started to grow in her, she started to blame Crystal for everything. And I think this was really easy for her to do because the Leonard family was already under scrutiny by the pastor and his wife. They were constantly under scrutiny, constantly being reprimanded. So it was really easy for Tiffany to kind of just put Crystal under that microscope and just blame her for everything that went wrong in Tiffany's life. And we will see later in this story that that hatred towards Crystal 
rears its ugly head once again. Now, when Crystal was 20, Pastor Jerry approached her and told her that he had picked a man out for her, and it was a boy named Chris Lindsay. Now, Chris Lindsay um, was a member of the church, but was just kind of an acquaintance of, Lin of Crystal's. They didn't really know each other very well. But Jerry told Crystal that her job was to rein in quote unquote, rein in Chris's loyalty to the church. And so Crystal saw this as an assignment from God. And so she went along with it. Crystal and Chris ended up, you know, dating and they were only dating for a couple months until they got married in November of 1999. Once again, all orchestrated by the hand of Jerry Irwin. Now let's learn about Sarah. Sarah is Debbie's daughter that one of the daughters that she had brought to the marriage between her and Bruce. So over a decade, Sarah dated a lot and moved around a lot until she ended up marrying a man named Andrew. After a little while, they ended up moving back to New York and she did end up cheating on Andrew a handful of times. Now, Andrew and Sarah were allowed to go to the church and attend WLCC even though they weren't members. Now, after a while, Andrew stopped going to WLCC services after one day he saw Jerry reprimand Bruce and Debbie in front of the entire congregation, and he was like, what the fuck? It made him feel so uncomfortable, and he was like, nope, I don't want any part of this, and he stopped going. Well, after a year of him not going, Sarah approached him, and she gave him an ultimatum. You tithe 10% of your gross income to the church, or I'm divorcing you. Andrew was like, fuck that, I ain't giving them my money. And so Sarah was like, bye. And she divorced him. Now, after they get divorced, uh, I think they had one child together. I think Sarah ends up moving into like some kind of apartment and she's trying to go to school. Now, at this time, I don't know that she's still attending WLCC. I think she wasn't, but she's going to school for something. And she ends up getting pregnant twice um, and has two more kids, but it's by two different dads. Now, after she has the third kid, she decides that it's time to go back home and she asks Bruce and Debbie if she can move back in. Now, they tell her, yes, you can move back in, but their only stipulation is that she needs to go to church with them. Like, it's a requirement you go to church every single Sunday. So, maybe this was their way of kind of like reining her back in and it worked. So, she comes back home and she ends up moving into the attic of their home. Now, I think it was Christopher that lived in the attic at this time and so he gets kicked out and now Chris and Lucas are sharing a room and in this attic is very small so it's her and her three, I'm pretty sure she has three kids at this point, three kids up in the attic. Now, soon after she moved into the attic, uh, Grace, her sister, ended up moving into the attic with her per Tiffany, Pastor Tiffany's demand. Now we'll get into Tiffany and how she becomes pastor in just a little bit, but Tiffany demands that uh, Grace ends up moving into the attic with Sarah and help her with the children. Now we find out later that the reason that Tiffany had Grace move into the attic was that, that Grace had confessed to Tiffany that Lucas had watched her shower and it made her uncomfortable and this was seen as SA in their eyes and so they ended up having her go into you know the attic with Sarah to try to protect Grace. Uh, again, none of this has been proven. This is allegedly from Grace. Now, Sarah didn't know exactly what had went on. She knew that something had happened. And so Sarah ended up becoming a little bit more paranoid of the boys. And she made that attic Fort Knox. She had lock upon lock upon lock. And there was no going in and there's no going out unless, you know, she was dictating it. Okay. She didn't want the boys coming up there and she didn't want her kids going out when she was not in control. Now, Sarah was kind of like Linda in the fact that she was very meshed with the Irwin family. She really wanted to please all of them all the time. And so she was reprimanding other people. She was tattling on other people. Now, as time went on, Sarah became more and more angry. I think she was just frustrated with maybe life. But this kind of anger really came out and, and her to her kids. Like the way that she would beat them got more and more intense. And she would even bring brag about the beatings that she gave her children to Tiffany in emails. She would even say in these emails, so-and-so, like naming a child, so-and-so got it so good. Like, 
That's not something to be proud about. Sarah made her kids study the Bible for hours. There was like specific things they had to memorize and Bible passages and all of this. And a lot of these kids were still very young and they were having to do this and they wouldn't finish until the wee hours of the morning. One, two, three a.m. It was even revealed as time went on and they were digging into this case. It was revealed that her first grader, first grader, had so much to do and it would take them so long to complete everything. They would be up until 2.30 in the fucking morning. That's fucking child abuse. Now let's get into how Tiffany ends up taking over the pastoral position at WLCC. So Tiffany became self-ordained, self-ordained, at 25. And in 2012, she had started to take over most of her father's responsibility at the church. The reasoning for this was that in 2012, Jerry's health had started to really decline. He had like broken his foot a couple times because he had no feeling in his feet because he had diabetes and he was not taking care of it. And then one day in May of 2012, Jerry suffered a stroke. But when he had this stroke, they did not take him to the hospital. None of them believed in modern medicine and they had a very large distrust for doctors. Jerry said that he believed doctors were trying to play God. Huh. I think thou dost protest too much there, Jerry. But anyway, your choice. So Jerry is left at home after this stroke and it's a pretty big one. Like he's like paralyzed in some spots and he's struggling and he can't walk. But remember, this happens in May of 2012. They don't tell the congregation. They just hide Jerry away in the parsonage, third story of the building, and they don't tell the congregation anything until August. But they blame the congregation for it. You know, like, you're sinners, you're rebellious, and you're the ones that opened this door, so now my father had a stroke. Uh -huh. It's all your fault. Wow. Okay, so, well... Jerry, for months, is struggling because he, you know, had a stroke and didn't get medical attention. And in December of 2012, his wife, Tracy, decides, okay, finally, I'm going to take him for treatment. I'm going to take him to a doctor, a real one, one with, you know, a certification, a license, you know, those things. So she takes him to Illinois to get treatment, but Jerry ends up dying in the hotel room. Now, Tracy, Jerry's wife, stated that they had woken up and found Jerry dead. He had just died in his sleep. But we find out years later, after all of this comes out, that Tracy had actually confided in that woman who was like a, a guest preacher that I talked about earlier. Um, she was connected to Tracy through Tracy like bred dogs and she had a bunch of dogs that she would sell. And this lady was a dog breeder too. And so they got connected and a long string of events. So she had actually confided in this lady because this lady was a nurse and this nurse lady um, that bred dogs was the one that convinced Tracy to take Jerry to Illinois for treatment. Well, Tracy confided in this lady and told her that he actually died in the hyperbaric chamber, that they put him in it before they went to bed, but then when they woke up, something had went wrong on the hyperbaric chamber, and uh, it killed him. Now, we can never confirm this because uh, Jerry was cremated, so we will never know if that is true, but uh, I believe it. So, yeah. Let's get into what they did after they found Jerry dead in the hotel room. So, Tracy wakes up, finds Jerry dead, and she's like, no, this can't be happening. So, her and I think both of her sons were with her, uh, Joseph and Daniel. So, they take Jerry's body and they put it in their van. They had put his dead body in this van because they wanted to take Jerry's dead body all the way to Arizona, Arizona, Arizona to see the world-renowned Mel Rond, Mel Rond, Mel Bond, Mel Bond from Agape Church, so that he could resurrect Jerry's body. Now, the whole time Tiffany is taking this trip, not Tiffany, Tracy, the whole time Tracy's taking this trip, she is actually like texting and calling and talking with that friend of hers who's a nurse. And she's like, <laughs> you're traveling with a dead body. Stop. Like, take it back. Like, he's decaying. Like, this is not okay. No, she would not listen. They literally drove the body all the way to Agape Church and she gets out. She tries to like talk to the people about like why she's there. And they were like, oh, um, 
no, leave now with your dead body. <laughs> like, we don't want anything to do with that. So they got turned away from the church. And so they have nothing else that they know what to do. And so they end up driving all the way back to the hotel in Illinois. And then they take Jerry's body and put it back in the hotel room. And that is when uh, Tracy ends up calling the um, funeral home wherever that is she calls them and she's like okay I got a dead body can you come pick it up and they were like ma'am you need to call the cops like this this needs to be clear before we can just go pick up a dead body so she called the cops and the cops get there and they notice that this body has been dead for a very long time and Tracy tells them that he had died that morning at like nine o'clock he's like uh ma'am like it's 3 a.m you didn't call the cops till 3 a.m the next day like what and she's like well we believe in resurrection and we believe in healing and so when we found him dead me and my sons we just stayed and we prayed over his body but it didn't work so them called you guys and so they took Jerry and they ended up, you know, clearing the scene and clearing everything, clearing the family and uh, they ended up cremating Jerry and they went back and Jerry was dead everybody was kind of shocked because like Jerry was their direct connection to God. So of course, Tiffany had already started to take over the church. And so it was natural for her to become the head pastor. She had already been doing it for months, basically. Well, the congregation was very hopeful that Tiffany taking over was going to make things a lot more mm, kinder, smoother. Having a female pastor was going to kind of loosen things up and she wasn't going to be as controlling. And at first, they actually got their wish. Like she did loosen up a lot of the rules and it seemed that things were gonna be on like an upward trajectory until they weren't. Now, it didn't take long for Tiffany's sermons to follow directly in the footsteps of her father. She was becoming very controlling and demeaning and just berating to all of the congregation members. Tiffany started to become so controlling that she made all of the congregation members keep daily journals. And not just daily journals, I mean minute by minute journals of everything that they were doing with their life and in their lives. And they had to submit it to Tiffany to read and go over every single week. Tiffany had also started proclaiming that she would know God would tell her if they were sinning and that she would confront them about it. So basically she was stepping into that same, I have a connection to God directly and he's going to tell me everything and you don't kind of thing, just like her father did. Tiffany even started a thing called counseling sessions. So these were sessions she would have with members where she would try to get them to confess to sins that they had committed. Usually Linda, the woman that I talked about earlier, and Joe, one of her brothers, Joseph, everyone called him Joe, they would attend these counseling sessions with Tiffany and whoever the congregation member was. Now they would usually be berating this person and trying to get them to confess. And a lot of these people would confess just to get it over with because these counseling sessions would go till one, two, and three o'clock in the morning. And if the member didn't confess to the sin that Tiffany oh so knew that they had committed, that it would turn physically abusive. Now, I think that the physical abuse at this time was just things like standing for long periods of time, being forced to do push-ups and things like that uh, is what I'm uh, what is what I was able to gather that's still abusive, but it didn't had turn to like torture. That is until we get to today's tragic case. But before we get to the case, I know I'm like, let me fill you in on all this information. We have to get into like kind of what led up to the events happening. And so we have to go to the downfall. Like what was the point where we think the downfall started to happen for this church and for Tiffany and for the congregation? Well, that was in 2014. So Tiffany and her brothers had gotten older at this point, And we know from the journals and from things that they have said that during this time, they really had all kind of just felt like their life had spiraled out of control. I think their dad had been, you know, gone for a little over a year, year and a half at this point, and they just felt like life sucked. They felt like everybody hated them, that they were horrible people. Um, they even had thoughts of unaliving themselves. They said that they felt like every single day was just trying to force one foot in front of the other. The brothers had started doing weed, drinking, and even smoking cigarettes. The youngest daughter had still believed in God, um, but she felt like their church was not doing it right. And so I think she was kind of waking up to the BS that was WLCC. And so the youngest daughter started to kind of do her own thing. She 
would come and go as she pleased, um, but she was still very much like a believer, okay? Well, the second youngest daughter, uh, Naomi, she mm, she became her own person. This girl just really branched off and stopped giving a fuck. She was dancing prov provocatively. She was partying. She was drinking, smoking. She was dating. She was giving into her lustful desires without any regret. Like this girl, I think she even had a job and a car. Like she didn't give a fuck. Well, one day in a big, huge blow up with her family, Naomi ends up getting kicked out of the church. And remember, that is where their family lives. So she now doesn't have a home and she now doesn't have her family and she doesn't have her church. This girl has lost everything. Around this same time is when a lot of members started to defect. They basically were leaving the church and going to other churches or just leaving altogether. And that means, you know, these people didn't work. They didn't have a source of income besides the tithe and the money that came from their congregation. So meaning that they started to struggle financially even more. When Naomi had and went to file her taxes for the first time after being kicked out of the church in her home, she requested from her mom the giving statement from the church. Uh, they did not have it. <laughs> that's illegal. So Naomi let them know that uh, that's illegal. And not only is that illegal, but she also let them know that they had missed the deadline to renew their nonprofit status, which meant that they were not entitled to their like property tax exemption. And so the city could go after them to regain that property tax, like charge them for the property tax for all the years that they claimed it and yet weren't entitled to it. So at this moment, Tracy and Tiffany were like, oh fuck, we're in trouble. And so they're like, we're being attacked by that devil. <laughs> yeah, where have we heard that one before? This made them spiral out of control. And Tiffany and Tracy were very well aware that they were struggling financially, not only because not very much money was coming in, but they had a lot of debt because Jerry's treatments that he did end up receiving in Illinois were a very pretty penny. And they were buying things like a $30,000 hyperbaric chamber. So, Tiffany had a plan. So one day, Tiffany gets up on her sermon and she says that God told her that somebody in the congregation was going to give a large sum of money and that if they didn't give this large sum of money, that God was going to punish them. Something bad was going to happen to them or somebody they love. And she said this person would know that God told them it's them that they need to give this money. And if they ignore it, mm -mm -mm, you're in trouble. And she said that they needed $4,000 for utilities, so like bills. They needed $10,000 for building um, repairs. And then they also needed $1,000 for the building fund. So she was asking for 15 grand. Um, I don't have that in my bank account. <laughs> Do you? I don't, I don't think any of these members did, honestly. Well, uh, weeks go by and nobody's giving $15,000. Shocker, right? Until one day, Tiffany gives a sermon and uh, she talks about it again. And then after the sermon, I think it was Joseph, ends up going up to, Joe, ends up going up to Crystal, uh, Bruce's daughter, and Bruce and Debbie's, Debbie's stepdaughter, goes up to her and says, we know it's you. God told us it's you. You're supposed to give the money. Crystal <laughs> is freaking out. Why? Because she actually talks to her husband about it. And at this point, Chris, her husband, was already kind of, over the church's shenanigans and he was like it ain't coming out of our bank account and so crystal's now thinking she as a stay-at-home mom has to come up with this money all by herself and who the where the fuck is she gonna come up with 15 grand like really nowhere so she is kind of freaking out doesn't know what to do she ends up talking to tracy tiffany's mom she talks to Tiff tracy and tracy says you know there's ways that we can get the money without Chris knowing. So like, we'll figure it out. Like you can get us the money. Well, one day at church, Crystal's husband, Chris was on his way to the bathroom when Tiffany passed him. And I think Tiffany had like said hi to him, but Chris did not realize that Tiffany was talking to him. And so he didn't say anything in response. Tiffany was pissed. Oh my gosh, how dare you ignore me? I'm the pastor. And so when he came back into the, you know, sermon area where they're, you know, the church, like, I don't know, sanctuary. Um, when he came back in there, they berated him like, how dare you ignore your pastor? I think it was like Joseph and Daniel who berated him and it pissed him off. He was like, I didn't even know that she was said hi to me. I thought she was talking to somebody else. 
And so after that, Chris was pissed. He was just like, I am done with this bullshit. I'm done. I'm not coming back anymore. Like, this church is a piece of shit. So he goes home. He tells Crystal this, and he's like, I'm done. And so Crystal decided to try to keep their marriage together and to just, you know, like she was kind of waking up to all the bullshit that was going on as well. They decide that they are now leaving WLCC for good. And July of 2014, she left and never returned. And the way she left was she ended up emailing Tiffany and emailing her parents and letting them know that she has decided to move on and go to a new church. Um, this was not received well as I'm sure we all could assume. After Crystal left the church, so many other people also left as well. This meant that the Irwins were struggling again financially. Not just again, they were struggling even more because now more people are not coming, meaning more tithe isn't being made. So they're struggling financially. They can feel the pressure of everything that's going on. Now, Tiffany made it known that she was very upset with everybody that was leaving the church and how they were leaving. She called them cowards because they were sending emails instead of like approaching her directly and having a conversation because, you know, who wants to sit and have a conversation with a cult leader about leading a cult? Come on. Yeah. Nice try to be manipulative, but... Swing and a miss. Now, in February of 2015, Debbie ended up having a heart attack, and Tiffany blamed Debbie's lying heart, rebellious lying heart, and that is why she ended up having the heart attack. Tiffany also got pissed because the Leonards did not invite Tiffany over to pray with Debbie during this entire, like, heart attack thing. So, like, how dare they? Now, that same year, they ended up taking Lucas to the doctor to get his knee looked at. His knee had been really, really bothering him, and this is from when he had broken it whenever he was a child. Well, they took him in, and they did some scans on it, and one of the scans came back with, like, I think a dark spot, and so they were calling to do more testing or something along those lines, and they, the Leonard family was really scared that it was cancer. Well, Tiffany again got pissed off because the Leonards again did not invite Tiffany to come pray with Lucas and the family. How dare they? And when she did approach them about this, she told Lucas that um, it was cancer and that God was giving him cancer and it was going to kill him because he was a rebellious, lying, you know, sinful person. And so this was God's wrath on him in his life. Doesn't she sound like a peach? Now, during this time, Tiffany would actually have counseling sessions with Lucas and berating him, calling him a liar, calling him a sinner, all this stuff, calling him rebellious over and over and over and over again, telling him he needed to repent, telling him he needed to confess. And the whole time his parents are present during all of this and they're not doing anything. And even Linda, great Linda, is present during these counseling sessions as well. And she is even chanting chanting in Lucas's ear, you're going to die. You're going to die. Now, August 6th of 2015, Crystal decides to go visit her grandma in, I think, a nursing home. And when she gets there to visit her grandma, her dad is there. Now, they had not talked or seen each other since she had left the church. I think it was the year prior. So it had been almost a year, actually over a year, since they had met, yeah. Now Bruce ended up embracing Crystal and she said it felt like old times, like just them sitting and chatting and being a family together and it was just very, very enjoyable. Well, Lucas ended up texting Crystal a few days later and asked if he could go to church with her to her church that Sunday. And he did. Well, it didn't take long after he went to church with her for uh, Tiffany to find out. And, oh, was she pissed. And they brought it up multiple times of, like, why did you go? And you're just trying to escape. And, of course, Tiffany's got to try to control the situation. So, again, she is has it out for Lucas because he's trying to leave or she feels like he's trying to leave. So she just becomes more berating towards him and his family. So now we're going to jump ahead in time just a handful of months to the tragic events of today's case. It is Sunday, October 11th, 2015. It is a Sunday. They are having service at the church, and this is one of those services that just never ends. It lasted till, you guessed it, 6 p.m. That's when they decided to take a break. This wasn't the end end of service. This was just break time. Everyone go get some food, grab a drink, and come back and be ready for more. Well, during this time, Lucas was actually like house sitting, dog sitting for um, a family friend or somebody down the street. And so they told Tiffany, uh, Lucas, I need to take Lucas. This is Bruce. I need to take Lucas to go and feed the dog and let him out or whatever. And then we'll be right back. 
They let him go, him and Bruce, but Tiffany was very upset that people were leaving the building, and they made it known. They even said that they thought Lucas was lying, that he had somebody's dog to take care of, because, like, who would hire Lucas? But they let him go, and so they left. They went and did their thing. They went and grabbed a drink, I think, from their house, and then they came back to the church. I think it was around 7-ish, and service continued. Now, when service continued, Tiffany made it very well known that she was very upset with Lucas, and she thought he was a sinner. Um, he was practicing witchcraft and he was rebellious and that he needed to do some confessing. So during the rest of her sermon, she was just berating the entire Leonard family, but very much specifically focused on Debbie and Lucas. Now church kept going from 7 until about 10 p.m. where church was finally dismissed, but she asked the Leonard family to hold back for a counseling session. I think right before the church service had ended, ended Lucas did end up admitting, confessing to practicing witchcraft and being rebellious and saying that he didn't want to stop being rebellious. Um, now, remember, when these people would have these kind of counseling sessions, they were berated so much by Tiffany, Linda, and all the other people that were present that they would just confess to things that weren't true so that the hopefully the counseling session would just end. So I think Lucas was probably just wanting the service to end, and so he just was like, yeah, I do witchcraft. Yeah, I'm rebellious. I need to change kind of thing. And so he just started confessing and hoping that maybe church would be over is my assumption, is my guess. Well, that didn't help because, you know, service ended, everyone's dismissed except for the Leonard's, they need to stay, counseling session. So this counseling session, boy, oh boy, it was awful. So everybody that was present at this counseling session was Bruce and Debbie, and then Lucas, and then his brother Christopher, and then Sarah, their sister, Tiffany, Tiffany's brothers, Daniel and Joseph. I think Joseph was like the main one there. Daniel was in and out, but like wasn't there very much. And then Tracy was there for a very, very short, brief time, but then she went up to her room and slept for the rest of the night. The kids that were present, like Sarah's kids, they were in another room, but they were in the building, but they weren't present during the counseling session. Now, immediately, Tiffany started berating Lucas and she started in on him. Why did you want to go to Crystal's church? What is going on? You just want to be rebellious. Blah, blah, blah. She is berating and berating, berating. So as as she is continuing to berate him, he just ends up confessing and says that the reason he wanted to go to church with Crystal was because it would give him an opportunity to SA his nieces when he rode in the car with Crystal to and from her church. Now remember, please keep this in mind. He is trying to just get the counseling session to end. So he's confessing to stuff that actually we find out later never really happened, okay? So please keep that in mind as we go forward because it's going to get graphic and it's going to get just the gross. So when this happens and when people hear him say that he had SA'd um, children, everyone starts to kind of freak out. And this is when Tiffany has Christopher come and stand beside Lucas and they start doing the counseling session for both of them. Now, when Christopher ends up walking up, Linda ends up smacking Christopher across the face immediately. And then in that moment, everybody is just just berating them with questions. When, why, how, what, who, everything. Oh, question after question after question. The boys stayed silent. And as the boys were staying silent, Joe ends up deciding to punch Christopher. And at that moment, the beating started. Now, the questions are still coming from Tiffany. Now, she stops her questions after a few minutes because she wants to make sure that the session, the counseling session, is being recorded. Yes, she would record every counseling session that she had. Everything was recorded. Like, literally everything was recorded. Because she pauses, you know, because priorities, right? Well, the dad ends up, Bruce ends up speaking up and says, if the boys stay silent, beat him. So everybody starts hitting Christopher. Lucas is just standing there. I'm pretty sure at this point Lucas is not being beaten at this point yet. This is when multiple people start hitting Christopher. Linda ends up punching Christopher so hard he ends up bleeding and then Debbie, his own mother, starts hitting him as well and then everybody else joins in. Joe ends up stepping in and ends up kicking Christopher and then decides to hold Christopher's arms back so everybody else can have a very clear and open area to punch and kick him. This is happening at church, okay? Then they focus on Lucas and they do the same thing. They just start beating him and they're beating both of them. I'm not exactly sure how it's going down at this moment, but both boys are being beaten senseless. Their arms are being held back. They're just getting kicked and beaten and it is 
brutal. Now the boys had stayed silent up until this point, but the boys cannot take it anymore. They have been beaten senseless. So Lucas decides to try to get the beatings to stop. He ends up starting to confess to things that he actually never did. And he is confessing to essaying on nieces, nephews, his neighbors, and even kids at the homeschool co-op that he was a part of. Christopher decides that he's going to join in and just follow his lead and try to get this beating to stop by making these confessions and see what that does. Now they had even confessed to essaying Sarah's kids. And remember, she lives in the attic, but also remember all of those doors are locked. So how did he get in and out? And he had even confessed, both of them had confessed to essaying, very graphically essaying, one of the babies, like penetration type essaying, um, the night before. Uh, but also, like, it's a very tiny attic. Sarah was asleep right there. And how were they doing this with, like, nobody waking up? There was also no blood. Well, Tiffany sends Sarah to go check that one child and see if there was any signs of trauma. Now, when Sarah went and checked that one child, there, of course, was no trauma. There was nothing. So now the adults are more determined to find the truth and beat the truth out of these two boys. So Linda, oh, Linda, ends up going and getting a power cord. Yes, you heard me right, a fucking power cord, like extension, thick power cord. She folds it in half and hands it to Bruce. Yes, the boy's father. And then that is when the beating turns to whipping. Now the people are holding the power cord by like the pronged ends, like folded together. And so it's just like the loop at the end. And they're using the looped end to literally whip the boys very, very hard. And during this time of them being whipped, they're being asked questions over and over and over again. Who, what, where, when, how, who did you essay? What are you doing? The, uh, I mean, question after question after question. And the boys are trying to confess to stuff and they're also staying silent at times and they're also continuing to still get beaten. Power cord ends up getting transferred to a few different people and then it lands into the hands of Sarah. Now, the boys had started confessing to watching some of the like nieces and nephews take showers, and this really enraged Sarah. All of the other confessions had really enraged her too. So she was just like, I mean, black outrage at this point. So she decides that when she whips the boys, she's going to flip the cord around. And so she's holding the looped end, and she's whipping them with the pronged ends. And she is, I mean, black outrage, right? So whipped, 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 whipped. She is annihilating them with this whip and she is cutting their skins. She is making them bleed. I mean, they are black and blue all over. They're bleeding everywhere. It is brutal. Not only that, she is taking that whip with the pronged ends and she is beating him in their genitals. Yes, you heard that right. She's beating them with the pronged end of a power cord in their genitals. Oh my God. When she was doing this, the boys tried to protect themselves, but Joe, oh Joe, would come up and hold their arms back to give her a clean place to just whip the crap out of these two boys. The boys are in so much pain and they are begging, begging, they're bawling, they're begging them to stop the beatings. And of course, it does not stop. They are bleeding. Lucas himself is bleeding so much from his groin area that it is puddling down his pants and even into his shoes. Linda has the audacity to come up to Lucas and whisper in his ear, not so tough now, huh? You even peed yourself. Ma'am, that's blood, not pee, you nincompoop. Now, during this whole entire beating, Tiffany never lays a hand on either of the boys. She doesn't have to. She has her cult. She has her posses to do it for her. She says, jump, they say, how high? And the boys continue to get beaten. Now, at 3 a.m., um, Bruce, the father, decides, okay, let's take a break because <laughs> they've been beaten for five hours now. Let's take a break and let's come up with a plan because they haven't gotten the truth or at least the truth that they feel like is the truth. What the fuck is the truth, right? Jesus fucking Christ, right? Ugh. Okay, so they take the boys and they decide that their plan is going to be to separate them. Maybe they'll get the truth if it's just one-on-one -on -one 
beatings. So they take one boy and take him out of the room and they put earplugs in him and th in his ears and then they take the other boy and they beat him while asking him questions, okay? This goes on between the two, jumping back and forth for a few more hours. The boys are in so much pain that their bodies cannot take anymore. They can't even stand up anymore. They are falling down. They're even dozing off. They don't know it at this point, but Lucas's body is shutting the fuck down. As he sat in a chair, crying, bawling, and literally dying, his mother is sitting in a chair just a few chairs away from him, and she decides, I'm gonna go to sleep and take a little nap. Bruce had even walked through and found Lucas like hunched over in the chair, mumbling, just like jibber jabbering, and never said or did anything about it. Now, a few hours later, somehow Lucas ends up on the ground and he's kind of writhing in pain, he's tossing and turning, and he's bleeding everywhere. Well, Joe decides, uh, you're not gonna be bleeding on my floor. So he ends up going and getting a tarp and he drags yes, drags Lucas onto the tarp. As hours went on and time passed, Lucas started moving less and less and less until he stopped moving altogether. Now, just before noon the next day, yes, they have been in this church uh, going through this entire beating process for just under 14 hours. So just before noon, um, Tiffany is in the sanctuary and she screams. And so Debbie and Bruce end up running in and they realize something is very wrong. Lucas is not only not moving, but they can't wake him up. Tiffany has been shaking him and trying to get him up and they can't. So something is very wrong. So I know I'm leaving you on a cliffhanger, but that is where we're going to end part one today. Oh my gosh, this case has been very consuming. I have dug into it. The book itself was 12 hours to listen to. And then I spoke with Crystal and I did more research and I collected more and more pictures for you guys. So this video is very chock full of everything. So I really needed, because of how much time it was taking me, I really needed it to be a part one and a part two for you guys. And I'm really, really, really sorry. But I want to hear from you guys. What do you like? Would you prefer me put it into one big massive video like two ish hours long? Or would you rather it be a part one part two? Let me know in the comments so I can know moving forward because cult videos do require more information. I love digging into them more because you got to know the details of how a cult is formed and what makes it tick and how people get involved in it and what makes them go from point A to point B to point C to tragedy. You know, we got to have all that in here. So let me know in the comments what you prefer, part one, part two, or a full, long, massive video so you can sit and consume in one setting. But until next time, be nice to each other, drink some water, take a nap, don't be a dick, you know, all that fun stuff. But I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!